Hey guys, firstly I wanted to apologize for not being at my laptop for the past few days. I had to attend a wedding in Scotland for one of my university friends. They booked it midweek and between you and me, I don't think it's going to last, which means not only have I neglected you guys, but I've also wasted money on a rental suit and John Lewis tea set. As always, thank you for your help in my ongoing attempt to find Alice. I'm now in full contact with the radio show she was working for, and they'll be sending over Rob's submission to the show as soon as they can. I've also looked up every town named Jubilation and have contacted residents from each of them. None of them have the particular junction mentioned in the previous log, Sycamore Row or Acer Street. I even combed Google Maps to make sure. I'm not sure what town Alice passed through last February, but it doesn't seem to exist on public record. The guy who promised to retrace the route from the mirror shop came through and has sent me a few possible addresses for Rob. He also mentioned looking into the game itself more. I'm not sure what he means by that, but I want to be clear. Please don't play this game on my behalf. I don't want that on my conscience. Without further ado, here's the following log. Thank you again. The Left Right Game, Draft 1, 10 2 2017 Possible opening... I want to address you, the listener, for a moment with the advance notice concerning the following episode. I'm not sure if it's been lost on you that every installment of the series so far has been played host to some strange, unexplainable occurrence and spanned a great many miles of travel. It goes without saying that this has been by design. I've been summarizing the countless hours of uneventful meandering and taking extra credit to document the strange phenomenon we've encountered along the way. I wanted the story to be fast moving, to have a real feel of progress with every chapter. If that sense of exploratory intrigue is why you're listening to this show, I completely understand. I'm certain it's a primary draw for almost all of you. The twists, the turns, the mysterious, strange encounters along an impossible road. But if that's the case, I feel it's my duty to inform you that apart from a few notable exceptions, there will be almost no ground covered in this segment, and the monsters we encounter will be all too human. Stress, divisiveness, and discomfort, and as one might imagine, grief. If you want to read the synopsis of this episode on the website and wait for the next part, then you'll be all caught up and I'm sure we'll be back on our way, heading once more into the great unknown. But I feel it's important to give the aftermath of Ace's capture its own episode in part due to the significance of the revelations that are unearthed in its wake, but also as a gesture of uh, deference to the man we lost. This is the story of our second night on the road. As we make the left turn, the horrifying space behind us is quickly replaced by a quiet emptiness ahead. The Wrangler crawls, defeated, towards the waiting convoy, the remaining four cars are parked haphazardly and taking up more than half the road. Rob drifts to the far end of the tarmac, looking to overtake and resume formation. Both of his hands rest on the steering wheel, his eyes fixed on some distant point in space. It's not hard to imagine that behind the focus and the quiet control, there's a man in turmoil. A man who can't bring himself to say anything, in fear of saying too much. This is Bristle to all cars. Get yourselves in formation and make way for those around you. We've got a while to drive before we stop for the night. Bristol, where's Ro- Ferryman? Ferryman's here. Where's Ace? Ace is... Ace didn't make it across. Uh, what? What the fuck? Bristol, where is he? It would be simple to describe what had taken place, or at least summarize the barest facts. What happened to Ace, where he is now why he isn't coming back, but for some reason I can't utter a word about what's transpired. Something about the event itself makes it impossible to retell, as if, as if the requisite phrases have been locked behind glass. We need to get to the stopping point. It isn't safe to stay here. Shortly after we turned the corner around Sycamore Row, Rob implied that the rest of the day's drive would be uneventful. Had he waited just a few minutes longer, he would have been entirely correct. We're on the road for another four hours, both of us quietly attending to our own preoccupations as the forest gradually thins out. 
The landscape gives way to the rolling cornfields that stretch out beyond the horizon on both sides. Nothing notable happens, which is ironic, as I find myself typing up a lot more notes than I need. With the sun descending through an orange sky as we pull into a clearing beside a wild grove of apple trees. Rob turns off the ignition and the two of us sit in silence. Rob's need to concentrate on driving has been a good excuse to stay quiet, a good excuse to not face each other. Now the wheels aren't turning, however, and the true reason for our mutual reticence is all too clear. Do you think he's dead? I don't know. Rob's response isn't reassuring, and I'm oddly grateful for that. There are no comforting words he can give me, and any attempt would have seemed horrifically insincere, a mockery of the situation's erroneous gravity. Anyway, given the circumstances of Ace's capture, I'm not even sure which answer I want to hear. Lilith appears at my window, wrapping her knuckles against the glass with an aggressive impatience. I'd expect nothing less about now. Everyone in the convoy has been made to follow a unilateral order. My order, without explanation. They've been traveling for hours, accompanied by the glaring absence of another human being. Looking in the wing mirror, I glimpse the rest of the convoy, standing by their cars, watching the Wrangler expectantly. Rob's hands still haven't left the wheel. With a sharp intake of breath, I press the door open and step out onto the grass. The ground is soft below me as I walk over to the group. There's recently been rain. I begin to address the rough semicircle. It almost feels like one of Rob's briefings. What's happening, Bristol? Today's turn back? I meet Apollo's eyes. For the briefest of moments, I consider telling them exactly that. Maybe it would save them from the slow, heavy ache that's currently weighing down on my chest. Maybe it would just save me from having a difficult conversation. Either way, I know I can't lie to them. They deserve the truth, however unpleasant. No. No, he didn't turn back. He crippled his car. The tow truck? Did he get out? The answer doesn't come easily. I'm being pressed to say the words aloud, and in doing so, to fully acknowledge what happened. It feels like I'm being driven to a funeral, like I'm being verbally marched toward an open casket. What happened to him? Bristol? He's dead, Eve. I hadn't heard Rob step out of the car when he reaches the group. It's hard to hide my relief as he takes over proceedings. Addressing the group matter-of-factly, now it really is like one of the briefings. Two guys in the tow truck coming out of jubilation. They got him. They took him back with them to the town. The way they were treating him, he won't last long. Oh, goodness. What? Rob, what are they going to do to him? I can't tell you. Nothing like this has ever happened before. Well, we need to go back. That ain't gonna happen. We're not going to fucking abandon him. Lilith. We're going back. No, we're not. Me and Rob can go. You know the place, right, Rob? The kid's dead, Apollo. But he was alive when you last saw him? That's right. So what point did you decide he was dead? When I saw him being carried away with the fucking toe hook sticking out of his mouth, goddammit. Rob shouldn't have said that. I understand his reasons, of course. He wants to convey an important truth that nothing can be done or could have been done to save Ace. His ghastly choice of words does the job, but it also sends a ripple of disturbance throughout the crowd, planting in everyone's minds the gruesome image I've been trying all day to uproot. Bonnie covers her mouth in shock and sorrow. Eve turns noticeably pale and even Lilith, who is intent on leading the questioning, is taken aback. Did... Did you see this, Bristol? I nod solemnly. The group bristles at my affirmation. I saw enough. I had to close my eyes. What happened, but... Rob tried to save him until... Before I can finish my statement, my words are cut off by something truly unexpected. In spontaneous response to my words, a harsh outburst of mocking, sarcastic laughter brings out from within the convoy. One by one, we turn towards its source until we find ourselves staring at Blue Jay. Her unapologetic chuckling fills the silent night air. Is something funny, Blue Jay? 
Blue Jay tries to speak through her all too slowly waning laughter. <laughs> it's just, it's just, you, you call yourself a journalist? You close your eyes. My God. There it is. There it is. I'm, I, I, I'm sorry. Do you close your eyes for magic tricks too? What the fuck, Blue Jay? Come on, this isn't the time. Oh, the time is well fucking overdue. Seriously, are you all morons? The left-right game is a hoax. It's fake. Rob Guthard's played you all like fucking children. Ace is fine. He's probably an actor. Like the hitchhiker was an actor and those town people too. I mean, come on. The group is taken aback by Blue Jay's incredulous tirade. She's clearly been holding her tongue since day one. A reaction to Ace's capture representing just one step too far. I saw Rob shoot one of the townspeople with a hunting rifle. I saw the wound. It was real. It was a blood-filled squib. The rifle is probably loaded with blanks. You can buy them from any good theatrical retailer. Seriously, what the fuck is wrong with you people? Okay, firstly, I don't like your fucking tone. Secondly, have you noticed that we've been the only cars on the road for almost two days? And what about jubilation? Are you suggesting Rob hired out a whole town? That would be fucking impossible. Oh, oh, sh oh yeah, sure. That's impossible. <laughs> But it's totally fucking believable that we're driving on a magic road. Maybe, maybe this is the highest budget scam I've ever seen. But that's all it is. A scam. And Al Jazeera here is giving him all the publicity he wants. I mean, these people are sheep, but you. You're a fucking psychophant. My mother used to tell me that you can't strike a person from the high road. Staring down the barrel of Blue Jay's darkly self-satisfied grin, I, I'm more than tempted to make that descent. Okay, Blue Jay, fair enough. I'm not going to pretend to know what's going on here. For all I know, you could be right. But why would Rob spend the production budget of a Hollywood film to trick a radio journalist and two vloggers? Trust me, our website does not get enough traffic for it. Oh, don't be so self-important. It's not you he's trying to trick. Blue Jay turns to Rob, fixing him a glare of pure, unadulterated triumph. Admit it, Rob. Admit that this is all a fucking farce. Admit that you knew who I was before I even got out of my car. Rob's face looks like it's been carved from granite. The group looks to him for an answer, but he delivers his response directly to Blue Jay. His eyes locked with hers. It's true. I know who you are, Denise. The atmosphere changes, and for a moment, the night erupts into a foray of whispers. Rob's answer clearly means something to everyone but me. Denise? Denise Carver? No. You serious? I'm sorry, who's Denise Carver? She's the biggest killjoy in the hobby. Oh, fuck you, you fucking airhead. Denise here is a member of the Skeptics and Rationalists Institute of America. She likes to get herself involved on ghost hunting expeditions under a false name so that she can debunk them publicly. You may have gathered she doesn't believe in the supernatural. Well, actually, I do believe in the supernatural. I believe that it's a billion-dollar industry built on selling comfortable lies to the gullible, and it thrives on shitty journalists and the attention whore bloggers who are willing to spread whatever shit they think will get them clicks. Is that why you took so long getting around the pine tree? Even when the truck was coming for Ace, you didn't think any of it was real? Uh, <laughs> did you? As condescending as her delivery may be, her words spark a sudden realization. It's true that with an unspeakably high budget and a few deft stooges, you could probably replicate most of what we'd seen on the road. Yet, without realizing it, I found myself agreeing with Rob's version of the events, personally defending the left-right game's validity against its decriers. I'd set off on this journey much like Blue Jay, as a staunch, confident skeptic, but somewhere between the tunnel and this moment, I'd become a believer. Blue Jay notes my lack of protest and turns back to Rob. I'm flattered you went through all this trouble. I, I, <laughs> I didn't know my work was so offensive to you. I admire your work, Denise. Always have. That's why I brought you along. That is bullshit. Tell your friend Ace he can't act for shit. Blue Jay pulls a pack of Marlboros out of her coat, lighting up immediately, and goes to sit on the hood of her car. Her demeanor clearly signals that her part in the conversation is over though her words leave a bitter aftertaste for everyone involved. To sympathize it must be exhausting, spending days with people whose opinions are diametrically opposed to your own, 
having to listen in silence while they corroborate their own seemingly preposterous views. Having said that, however, I'm incredibly glad she stopped talking. It reminds me of a time when we got on much better. The next question comes from Eve, her voice quivering. Can... can we die here, Rob? The quiet force of her words turns everyone's heads back to Rob. It's clear that others have been thinking the same thing, and they're looking to Rob for an answer. It's possible. The road ain't ever killed no one before, not as long as everyone followed the rules. But you said in your emails it was dangerous. That's right. But you didn't feel like telling us that we could die out here? Rob turns to Lilith clearly offended by her accusation. In the 1920s, John Enborough killed 36 people and violated their bodies. In one of your videos, you guys went to his home in Virginia looking for the man's ghost. Bonnie and Clyde once spent 500 to stay in the Iowa murder house, a place that's supposed to possess its victims and force them to kill each other. If you all honestly believed in what you were chasing, you should be accepting death as an outcome every time you step out. We're all looking for evidence of another world. What we're doing here has the scientific significance of the moon landings, the cultural significance of Columbus reaching the Americas, and a whole lot of people died doing both. If you accepted the risk of chasing down the ghost of a two-bit serial killer, you should have been willing to accept the risks for this. Lilith looks like she's been scolded by a parent. There's a fire in her eyes as she observes Rob, meeting his criticism with scorn. Oh, so it's Ace's fault. He should have just accepted the risk? He did accept the risk. Ace made his decisions. He saw the dangers on the road firsthand and he kept going. I told you this place could be dangerous and maybe you didn't take that seriously, but you are not going to treat me like I lured any of you here under false pretenses. We stand for a few minutes in the uncomfortable void left by Rob's words. No one's quite sure where to look. Well, what do we do now, Rob? Do we turn around? I ain't gonna make that decision for you. If you want to split off and head back, I'd suggest you wait till morning and stagger your leaving times by about an hour or so. i never seen nothing like what happened back there before, but this is the most people I ever played the game with. Maybe that's doing something. What do you mean by that? Well, well, it's the only thing that's changed. Truth is, this ain't our world. By all rights, we shouldn't be here. Even when it's one car, the road always tries to discourage you. Maybe it's like bacteria in a vein. One or two might slip by unnoticed, but once it hits a certain point, it's like, um, like an immune response. You think the road's pushing back on foreign objects? And the bigger the group, the more violent the response. It makes sense until Blue Jay laughs once more. Hearing her reaction, I reassess what I'm saying and can't help but feel a little foolish at the idea. Maybe. It's just a theory. I don't know. Rob collects himself, regaining his composure. Either way, you all have till morning to decide if you want to keep on the road. Bristle, if you want to go home, you gotta find someone to take you. I ain't ready to head back yet. He turns away from the group and marches to the Wrangler. I don't see him again for the rest of the evening, and I have no intention of bothering him. Eve and Lilith immediately crowd around me, asking if I'm alright and taking it in turns to disparage Rob's actions. I can't bring myself to join in. All I can say to myself is, can I charge my phone in your car? The group has very little to say the rest of the night. A deep solemn hangs in the air, dampening any semblance of good cheer like wet leaves on dwindling fire. No one offers any conversation. Apollo's reservoir of quips is run dry. Everyone's wondering where they'll be going from here, pondering the sort of person they are in circumstances such as this. Do they press onward toward danger, or back toward safe and familiar ground? It's a question they'll have to figure out for themselves, ideally before sunrise. I already have questions of my own. About an hour after Rob's departure, bidding farewell from the rest of the group, I walk to Lilith and Eve's car. My bag is resting on the front seat, and the black wire leading inside from the charging port. I've decided not to tell the pair that I've been charging the detonator for a military-grade explosive less than ten meters away from them. Perhaps it will come out during broadcast, and if you're listening to this... Sorry, girls. I pick up my bag, and, checking that no one's looking, make a beeline for the apple grove. I march through the small wood, the air growing still, the sounds of the convoy quietly fading behind me in the late evening darkness with the moon shrouded by a legion of crooked trees. 
I'm puzzled, but I'm not more afraid. I've seen what happens on this road, and as I pass through the grove and into the neighboring field, intentionally isolating myself from the rest of the group, I'm quite aware that help won't be coming for me. Even so, as the corn rises in every direction around me, I find myself almost incapable of fear. The day's events have drained me of emotion, and now with everything else pulled away, I'm left with only one driving directive, an overpowering urge to figure this road out, regardless of what that entails. Judging the distance I've traveled to be acceptably out of range from the convoy, I pull the block of C4 out of my bag and place it on the ground. Gritting my teeth, my body cringing with self-inflicted dread, I press the power button on the Nokia and wait for something to happen. My worries of instant disintegration are laid slightly as the grainy image of the two outstretched hands comes into view, swiftly replaced by the menu screen. I work fast, the words on the brown paper package constantly reminding me of where I'm putting at risk with every passing second. Firstly, I type my own number into the phone, assuming, or at least hoping, that the mechanism isn't activated by the outgoing calls. A few seconds later, my cell phone rings, giving me the Nokia's number. Checking the call logs, I find a second, different number, which seems to have made a call to the phone three times in quick succession. If I were a betting woman, which I sometimes am, I'd suggest that this number belongs to whoever built the bomb. The calls representing an attempt to test the trigger prior to implementation. If I'm right, then this should be the personal number of whoever was driving that crashed car. My third discovery is a little bit more puzzling. No texts have been sent from the phone, however, there is one solitary message residing in the phone's inbox. It's from a third, separate number, and it reads thus. Please don't do this, Rob. I stare at those four words, the new information grating uncomfortably against my already preconceived theories. If this text is to be believed, and my previous deductions are at all correct, then that means that Rob Guthard was driving the car that the C4 in the trunk belonged to him. All this time I thought Rob may have been responsible for something terrible, but what if he was run off the road himself? If that's the case, then that leads to an entirely new question. Who was responsible for his crash? As I begin to think it over, the air explodes around me. I'm jolted out of my examination by a powerful echoing voice which reverberates the very air. The corn is thrown into a frenzy as the noise echoes from every direction as if spoken by the air itself. I've watched you question you. Without a second's hesitation, I turn off the Nokia and throw the block into the bag. I jump to my feet and scan the cornfield for whoever spoke the words, backing away towards the convoy, suddenly, realizing how far I am from my friends. I break into a run, my boots pounding the dirt as I flee back to the woods. Less than a minute later, I burst through the trees, my bag swinging with the weight of the block. Everyone's in their cars, seemingly fast asleep. I'm starting to think they're onto something. With no one to talk to and a long day ahead of me, I suppose there's no further recourse but to catch my breath, write up my immediate thoughts, and then finally get some much needed rest. I feel a dull pressure behind my eyes as I step towards the Wrangler, quietly opening the back door next to my sleeping area. I carefully hide the block under my luggage, then silently closing the door again. I wander around the passenger side, where my notes are waiting to be typed. I reach out and grab the handle, gripping it tightly. I don't open the door. In fact, after a moment of staring through the glass, I let it go. The pressure behind my eyes gives way, and before I know it, I've slid down to the damp ground, my back against the cool, hard metal of the door. A whine catches in my throat as ugly tears stream down my cheeks. My breath shudders as I inhale, and my attempt to breathe out plays to the world as a quiet, declining sob. The tears take me by surprise, but I don't wipe them away. In a bittersweet way, they're welcome, necessary, even. They carry with them a familiar sense of heart-rending release. By the time they've run dry, I feel like I might just be able to move on from the events of the day. The sounds in my head are just a little quieter now I've paid them their due. Are you okay, honey? I'm picking myself up when I see Bonnie walking carefully over to the Wrangler. I brush myself off, a little embarrassed at being caught. Oh, I didn't know you were awake. <laughs> I'm, I'm a light sleeper. 
And Martin, er, Clyde, snores. Do you need someone to talk to? I think I just need sleep. Thanks, Bonnie. My name's Linda, if you're wondering. Alice. That's a beautiful name. Well, Alice, uh, I know I don't talk much, but I know how to listen, if you ever want me to. For the first time since the pine fell, I find myself smiling. It's a weak smile, but a smile nonetheless. Thank you, Linda. I might take you up on that. Have a good night. Have a good night. Bonnie starts to walk back to the car before pausing and turning around. One last piece of comfort to offer. And remember, everything will be alright once we get to Wintry Bay. I frown a little, unsure what Bonnie means. She smiles back blankly, then resumes the path back to her car. She's mentioned that place before, upon leaving jubilation, in what seems like a moment of idle reminiscence. How she mentioned it just now doesn't seem like reminiscence at all. After everything that's gone on, all the suspicion I've been directing at Rob, all my worry for Ace, is something the matter with Bonnie? Perhaps I'm misunderstanding, perhaps Bonnie misspoke, but all the same, the brief comfort her words afforded me has already faded away, leaving a familiar feeling of confusion and paranoia in its place. I let myself into the passenger side, type up a few pressing notes, and then climb through onto the air mattress. Sleep doesn't come easily. I close my eyes and try to convince myself that tomorrow will be better than this harrowing day. But every time I try to make that particular argument, a voice in my head responds that may depend on which way you turn. <laughs>